Acts chapter number 8. I'm just going to read a couple verses and we'll get, uh, share with you what God showed me on this. In verse number 1, the Bible says, And Saul was consenting unto his death. Talking about Stephen. And at that time, there was great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Let's pray. Father, well, the singing was a real blessing, Lord. It uplifted our spirits. God, we thank you for it. Thank you for the good prayer time. Thank you for your people. Lord, like that first song they sang, thank you we got a Bible to read. We don't have to question whether or not it's your word. And God, I'm glad we got a good church to come to to worship you tonight. And God, you've been good to us. And I pray you'd bless and you'd help now the reading of the word of God. And Lord, use this unworthy vessel to deliver the message. And God, I pray you'd encourage and edify your people tonight. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I want you to notice three things about these two verses. I want you to know, first of all, in these verses we find Saul's blessing. In verse number one, it said, And Saul was consenting unto his death. That means that Paul sanctioned it, or Saul sanctioned it. He blessed it. He said, You have my blessing on murdering this man. Now, if you're a student of the Bible, you know Saul here is the great apostle Paul before he was the great apostle Paul. This is Saul the sinner. This is Saul who was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a ruler in the Jewish community. And here we see Saul is giving his blessing on killing uh, Stephen who just preached uh, to these Jews. Uh, Matter of fact, he called them uncircumcised of heart who do always resist the Holy Ghost. And we find they didn't like it. And can I say, uh, truth will do one, two, one or two things. Uh, it'll either cause somebody, to, their eyes to be open, they'll get under conviction, repent, get right, or it'll make people mad. Yeah. And this crowd, it made them mad because they resisted the Holy Ghost. Uh, they wanted to stone Stephen, and Paul says, have at it. And can I say, uh, every man that threw a rock was guilty of Stephen's death, and so was Saul. So we see Saul's blessing. And I want you to notice, if you will, the scattering of believers. In verse number 1. It says, and at that time there was great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the reg regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. If you remember in Acts chapter number 1, verse number 8, the Lord Jesus, before he ascended into heaven, he told them that when the Holy Ghost came upon them, they would be witnesses unto him in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the world. Uh, can I say in Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, uh, we see the fulfilling uh, of that prophecy and that promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he never lies to us. Uh, he always speaks truth. Uh, but can I say, uh, they might not have had to suffer the persecution had they done what God wanted them to do. Uh, by the time we get to chapter number 8, we know in uh, uh, chapter number 2 that 3,000 souls were added uh, unto the church uh, on the day of Pentecost. Uh, uh, you just read over a little bit uh, farther, you find 5,000 more were added. Uh, you read on and then another great multitude is added. Uh, and by the time we get to chapter number 8, uh, it is believed that somewhere in the upwards of 30,000 people uh, have been saved saved at the church at Jerusalem. Uh, and my dear friends, if they'd been faithful, I, I'd have said, we don't need 30,000 of us around here. Uh, uh, why don't you take 5,000 and go to Samaria? Why don't you take 5,000 and go to Judea? Why don't you take 5,000 and go down to Jericho? Uh, why don't you go over to Galilee? If they'd have been uh, faithful to send out missionaries and plant churches and preach the gospel to those regions, persecution wouldn't have come. Can I say a lot of times 
we go through what we go through because we haven't been obedient to what God said to do. We see Saul's blessing. We see the scattering of believers. And then in verse number 2, we see Stephen's burial. It says, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Now, boy, there ain't a whole lot of good stuff in that, is there? That would depress the socks off of you. Hmm? I mean, we got a tyrant named Saul consenting to Christians dying. We got believers running for their lives. And we got the burial of one of the first deacons of the first church of Jerusalem. This is what I want to preach on. I want to preach on from gloom to gladness. Because it's pretty gloomy in those verses. But hang on, it gets real glad down here in a minute, okay? Um, from gloom to gladness. Some of you look a little gloomy. Uh, been working on the job and, you know, been having to contend with the flesh and the world and the devil. Uh, I mean, some of you look like the Democrats. They look pretty gloomy. Huh? Did you hear that one idiot senator wants to impeach Trump because at that summit there was just as many North Korean flags as there were U.S. flags? <laughs> Hello, it was a joint summit. Uh, they wasn't going to get that guy to show up if he was going to treat him like a second-class citizen. Uh, there had to be some tact. and There had to be some uh, diplomacy. Uh, these goofy senators, huh? Well, some of you look like that. You look like you want to impeach me, huh? <laughs> Well, I got news for you. You can, but it's all right. It's a little gloomy, but it's going to get glad. I want you to notice the progression from the gloominess to the gladness. You've got to see what it takes to get glad. Can I say, first of all, you've got to see what started the gloom, and it's persecution. Nobody likes persecution. Nobody likes going through hardness. Nobody likes bad things to happen. Nobody likes dark clouds. Everybody wants a Joe Osteen, something good's going to happen to you. Why do you think he's so popular? Why do you think he sells so many books? Why do you think that people pay $10 a head just to go sit in his auditorium every Sunday? And, and I'm talking about a 30,000-seat arena that's packed out. Why do you think that they hang on every word that he says? Why do you think he's on TV? Because he's giving them hope. Now, he's lying to them. Job said, man's days are few and full of trouble. You're going to face dark clouds. Every day is not a Friday. And can I help you with something? I've had some Fridays that weren't all that spectacular. Huh? We don't want to be persecuted. You know, that's why some people will never give anybody a gospel tract. That's why somebody will never invite anybody to church. That's why some people will never tell anybody that they believe in Jesus Christ because they don't want to suffer any repercussions. They're afraid they're going to offend people. Would it be better to offend them? And by the way, most of the time you don't offend them. Most of the time people will thank you. But can I say, would it be better to offend them now than to watch them die and go to hell? You might be the only one that can reach them. Or you might be the very one that starts planting the seed and then God sends somebody else to water it. But can I say, gloom starts with persecution. I find three areas of persecution. I want you to notice, first of all, there's persecution on the house of God. Look in verse number one again. And Saul consenting unto his death, and at that time there was great persecution against the church. You see that? Great persecution persecution against the house of God. Can I say there, there always has been. If you've never read that little pamphlet called The Trail of the Blood, just take you about an hour to read it. Uh, 
I highly recommend you read it. Uh, 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 you can see, uh, 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 and we know that each of the apostles except for John uh, uh, died a martyr's death. Uh, uh, there was bloodshed uh, because of their faith. Uh, and can I say, uh, ever since Jesus ascended uh, and ever since the day of Pentecost and the power of God fell on the church uh, and folks started getting redeemed uh, and people started leaving religion uh, uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, there's been persecution. Uh, uh, can I say Pirates have tried to stamp out the church. Uh, they've tried to do away with it. Uh, there have been people burned at the stake. Uh, there's been people beheaded. Uh, there's been people boiled in oil. Uh, there's been people who's been threatened. Uh, there's been men who've watched their wives and children burn at the stake uh, all because they had the audacity uh, to bow their knee uh, and repent and trust Jesus as Lord and Savior. Uh, and when they were told they had to back up on it, they can't, they couldn't couldn't do it because uh, Jesus had changed their lives. Uh, if you never read the book, Fox's Book of Martyrs, I highly recommend it. Of what people went through so you and I could have a service tonight. And there's persecution against the house of God. The last president we had commented on people like you and I and told us that we were right wing, Bible believing gun toters. Uh, and we were terrorists to this nation because we had the audacity to believe in God. The liberal left will say that if you have faith in God and if you go to church on a regular basis it's because you're weak-minded. You're the butt of every joke uh, except for Donald Trump. He's been a great help to late-night TV. They got off Christians' backs. Uh Our vice president, who's made no bones about his faith and his belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, has suffered great, great, great persecution because of his faith. The house of God is under great persecution in these verses. Can I say? It's pretty gloomy. Not only is the house of God under persecution, the Holy Ghost filled were under persecution. And verse number 2 says, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial. You know why they hated Stephen? It wasn't only because of what he said, it was the power in which he said it. The Bible says in Acts 6, 5, And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. In chapter 6, of verse number 8, said, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. In chapter 7, and verse 55, says, But he being full of the Holy Ghost. Uh, listen, uh, uh, it's one thing if you just walk up and say, Melissa, you're uncircumcised of heart and you're wicked and God doesn't approve of how you live. That's no threat to you. But with great boldness, he gets down in their face and says, you're the one that hung him on the cross. You're the one that missed God. And you uh, slew the prophets and you are on your way to hell. Made a difference. He was full of the Holy Ghost. And can I say, Holy Ghost filled people are always under persecution. Can I say, the Lord commands us to not drink wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Ghost. You know what there's a lack of in this day and age? Holy Ghost filled people. It's been a great tact of the devil and it's through great persecution. Can I say, every one of us are so busy we don't take the time to pray and be filled with the Holy Ghost we rush into church and rush out can I say being filled with the Holy Ghost is more than reading your Bible praying a little prayer and come to church three times a week 
Being filled with the Holy Ghost is a conscious mindset to yield yourself to God of every minute of every day. And there's not a lot of people walking the face of the earth that is full of the Holy Ghost. Can I say? And how it has been masked in a lot of churches is through all kinds of other things like legalism. Like uh, setting yourself up on pride that you're better than other people because they don't believe like you believe. Claiming because you keep a set of rules, you're spiritual. That don't make you spiritual. The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Amen. Can I say, Holy Ghost filled people are always persecuted. You know who they're persecuted by the most? Religious people. You start seeing people filled with the Holy Ghost, other people start tearing them down. Well, they must be compromisers. See, when you're full of the Holy Ghost, you don't have time for a bunch of junk. All you're concerned about is Jesus and walking with Him. Look at how they persecuted Stephen. Can I say, first of all, they persecuted them with their lips. Look in verse 54 of chapter 7. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. They began to bite and chew on him. But can I say, if you get full of the Holy Ghost, people will persecute you with their lips. They're not going to bite and chew on you, but they're going to run you down. They're going to talk about you like a dog. They're going to look to find fault in you. They're going to say, oh, they think they're better than somebody else, and they're going to constantly run their mouth about you. Can I say, if somebody doesn't run their mouth about you, I'd check up. The Lord talked about, you know, beware when everybody has everything good to say about you. Hmm? They not only persecuted him with their lips, they persecuted him in their listening. Look in verse 57 of chapter 7. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. Can I say... Most of the people you try to witness to on the job or in your, in your daily life, they don't listen to what you have to say. That's a form of persecution. Can I say if you stand up and teach the Word of God or you stand up and preach the Word of God and people ignore you, that persecutes you. Hmm. Brother Lawrence was telling me about a preacher friend of ours said the other day he'd studied 86 hours in one message. Put 86 hours into one message. Preached it with everything he had. And on the way out, one person told him that was a good message. You put that kind of time into something, you don't want people to pat you on the back. You want it to change people's lives. But when they're sitting there doing this, now listen, you don't look around church and see people doing this. But a lot of times they're not taking notes. They're doodling. Yep. They've tuned you out. That's a form of persecution. Not only did they persecute him with their lips and in their listening, but they persecuted him with a loathsome public disdain. They drug him out and they stoned him to death. Unlawful to Jewish law. This very crowd that claimed to be the religious crowd broke their own laws by not even giving him a trial. Saul of Tarsus became judge, jury, and executioner that day. Not the Sanhedrin council. Not Pilate. He was not given... A, stand, a chance to stand before the ruler of Rome. The house of God we find persecuted. It's gloomy. The Holy Ghost filled persecuted. But I want you to notice the home is persecuted. Look at verse number 3. A lot of people miss this. As for Saul, here he goes again. He made havoc of the church. Look here. Entering into every what? House. And hauling men and women, committing them to prison. He went in the homes where they were meeting, 
or if he heard there's a crowd down there at that house that are Christians, uh, he broke into their homes and persecuted them. The Bible says he wrecked havoc. You know what that word havoc means? It means to destroy. It means to devastate. It means to ravage. Uh, it signifies the act of a ferocious animal seeking and devouring its prey. Does that sound like a lawful act? Uh, he would break down the doors uh, and he would ravage people in their own homes uh, uh, just like uh, uh, when uh, uh, marauders would, uh, would uh, pillage a village and burn everything down uh, in the name of their cause. Uh, that's what Saul was doing. Uh, he'd come to Alexandria Cold Springs uh, and break into your house, uh, kick your cat in the head, uh, grab you and drag you off to jail. Not even give you a voice men women and children torn apart like a lion or a bear tearing apart its prey you ever see a lion attack a zebra and start eating it that's what Saul was doing in the homes of our forefathers in the faith that word hauling or hailing, however it's pronounced I don't know is the same word uh, that we get the word hauling from it means dragging they drug them through the streets and made open examples of them and say, anybody else that believes in this Jesus, this is your fate. No wonder they scattered. Can I say? Pretty gloomy. Dark days of the early church. Boy, we really suffer for Jesus, don't we? We really got it bad. You invited somebody to church and they didn't show up and you think you're really being persecuted. Can I say, we see the persecution. That's the gloomy part. But how do we get to gladness? Well, there's a progression. Do you know how God chose with dealing with persecution? He let them all have big weenie roast and roast marshmallows and they had a good time. That's what gets you through persecution. No. No. It's not, having having a, a, a Sunday sit-down dinner on the ground. Everybody eats some fried chicken and, and eat some green beans and mashed potatoes and, and somebody eats some pie and it'll all be good. No. That's not how God dealt with it. How did God help them with the persecution? Well, it's right here. Look at verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere, what's it say? Preaching the word. Can I say the only way God chooses to deal with persecution is preaching. Can I say God not only chose preaching to, to save them that would believe, uh, but God chose preaching to deal with persecution. Uh, the only thing that's going to edify the people of God, the only thing that's going to build them up uh, uh, when the world's beat on them, uh, uh, when the world's come against them, uh, when religions come against them, uh, uh, when tyrants uh, are threatening them, uh, hey, the only thing that's going to help them uh, is if they can gather together uh, and a man of God get up and preach thus saith the Lord. Uh, He'll never forsake you. He'll never leave you. He's a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. Uh, hey, they may take you, uh, but they can't get your soul. Uh, he promised uh, he's going away, but he's uh, coming back. Uh, but he's going to prepare a place for us. Uh, they'll not break into that place. Uh, it's a place with streets of gold, uh, mansions over the hilltop. Uh, you know what to help you in your persecution? Uh, I said, preach and I help you. Uh, that's why we need to get back to the house of God. That's why it's important to come out on Wednesday night. That's why it's important to be here for Sunday school. That's why it's important to be here for Sunday morning. That's why it's important to be here Sunday night. We need preaching because we live in a world. We're in it, but we're not of it. They don't understand us, and they want to destroy us. we got a devil that hates us. He wants to destroy us. You got a coworker that disdains you and they want to destroy you. Uh, there's people in the shadows just hoping you fall. We need preaching. Can I say? God chose through preaching to help them with their persecution. Well, what's the progression? How do we get to gladness? Well, after preaching, notice the pulling together. Look in verse number six. And the people, look what it says with one accord 
gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. What did they do? They united. They'd been persecuted. They'd been scattered. And all of a sudden, the man of God gets to preaching. They come together. They unite of one accord, and they give heed. Or in other words, they obey those things that he'd been preaching. Uh, hey, uh, uh, when we uh, come together in unity uh, and do what God says, uh, your gloominess will flee. Uh, gladness is just over the horizon. Uh, you're going to get some help. Uh, God's going to lift your spirit. Uh, God will help you, my dear friends, when we unify under preaching. Unity brings unction. Division brings discouragement. Mm -mm. Can I say? Mm, preaching seeks to unite people with God. And then God unites His people. Very important. Preaching, let me say it again, seeks to unite people with God. What preaching should do is that old hymn writer said best turn your eyes upon Jesus preaching will get your eyes on Jesus and your heart in tune with God and it will unite you with God and then God through the spirit of God unites his people together notice the progression there's persecution gloomy then there's preaching to deal with the persecution and then there's a pulling together folks start getting in accord uh, listen, why did he say where two or three were gathering his name? He said, you don't need a multitude. You just need a handful to get together. Yeah. Center around Jesus. Uh, get to uh, build up in, in the Holy Ghost on, through preaching and your gloominess is going to flee. Why? Because look what happens next. The power of God falls. Uh, look at verse 7. Huh? Uh, it says for unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them uh, and many taken with salt with palsies uh, and that were lame were healed what happened uh, uh, listen uh, uh, they've scattered they've been under great persecution uh, 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 listen not only did believers go but everybody in their family went uh, some of them hadn't become believers yet uh, uh, they got out there and there was some preaching went on uh, and then they became together in one accord uh, and then the the power of God fell uh, and those that weren't believers became believers hallelujah that's what happens uh, when we unite revival falls uh, sinners get saved uh, those that had uh, palsies and those that were lame were healed but hey the possessed uh, got born again uh, why the power of God's what makes the difference uh, you'll never have the power of God without preaching uh, you'll never have the power of God without unity uh, but oh when you get good preaching uh, and you get in unity uh, and the power of God falls uh, the gloominess is gone hallelujah Amen. notice if you will the peace in verse number 8 and there was great joy in that city and in verse 1 there's great persecution but in verse 8 there's great joy Huh? Oh, verse number one, there wasn't nothing but gloom. Y'all was looking at me and said, Preacher, you said you're going to help us. What's going to help us here? You's all looking at me like a bunch of Democrats looking at Trump. I told you that. I mean, there ain't nothing good in verse one. Uh, hey, they're at a funeral in verse number two. Uh, I mean, it's looking bad. Uh, but uh, hey, neighbor, uh, uh, God got them where he needed them. Uh, and some preaching got on. Uh, and they got together in unity. Uh, and the power of God fell. Uh, and peace fell on them. Uh, and there's great joy uh, their gloom uh, turned to gladness uh, why God didn't forsake them uh, I challenge you to go read the rest of this chapter and the chapters that fall and see the world got turned upside down I'm reminded what Joseph said when he looked at his brothers and they began to apologize at him for what they'd done in their ignorance when they were younger and they sold him into slavery he said you meant it to me for hurt but God meant it for good. Uh, 
Oh, Saul Tarsus was the head persecutor. Uh, read the next chapter. He gets born again. Hallelujah. And he becomes uh, uh, one of the great preachers. Uh, why, God, uh, I looked at what the devil meant for hurt, uh, but God meant it for good. Uh, and hey, gladness came. You might have come in here tonight. Lo, just get hooked up with Jesus. Get hooked up with his people. Put your faith in the Lord and your loneliness will turn to joy. Uh, he is the lily of your valley. He is a peace that passes understanding. He said, my peace I leave with you. Not a peace like one. My peace. You know what? He's the prince of peace. When he talks about his peace, he's talking about himself. He said, I'll just hang out with you. Can I say, if you hang out with Jesus you'll find no dark clouds because he's the light of the city we're going to. Can I help you something? Yeah, it was gloomy. It was bad, but it got good. And it may be gloomy tonight. Just hang around, neighbor. Just get where God wants you and get in on what God's doing and it'll get good. And you know what happens when it gets good? It gets gooder and gooder and gooder because he isn't anything but good. Uh, their gloom got turned to gladness. Now, how about you tonight? You going to let him turn your gloom to gladness? Because I'm going to tell you something. If they just stayed in Jerusalem, you know what was there? Persecution. You can stay under your juniper tree if you want to. And there isn't any good there. But if you get out from underneath that juniper tree and you get around preaching and you get around unity, you're going to find goodness. You're going to find great joy. You're going to start, you know, the problem is in verse 1, they're all looking at themselves and they're getting out of there. But by the time they get down there where preaching's got on, they got together, all of a sudden they're looking at what God's doing in other people's lives. And the Bible said there was great joy. Great joy. Ain't nothing like seeing God save a bunch of folks. Yeah. Huh? There ain't nothing like God, like you've been beat on and all of a sudden God gets the blessing on you. Are you listening? Yeah. Nothing like it. They got great joy. So I wonder tonight, are you willing to get out from underneath your, your gloomy tree and let Jesus lead you to some gladness? He's for you. He's not going to promise you every day is a Friday, but he's going to promise to be the apple of your day every day. You just got to look on him. You'll never find any fault. You'll just find help in time of need. Let's all stand tonight. Brother Clint, you kill Life's too short to be miserable when Jesus is so wonderful. Some of you are already fretting about things that are out of your control. Huh? We don't know what a day brings forth, but I do know this. He's already there. It'll be all right. So uh, they're picking out songs, some are praying. Maybe you just need to come thank him for getting you out of some gloominess. Maybe you just need to come tell him you love him. Maybe you just need to come and thank him. And if I found out a long time ago, if I just start thanking him in advance because he does all things well, guess what? By the time I get there, it's just good. So maybe you tonight you just need to come and talk to him. They're, they're picking out song. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I know there are days we're persecuted. This flesh, this old world, and even by the sorry, no good devil. God, I know there are days that are hard days and there are days that are weary days and there are just days we're slothful and don't care. But Lord, I'm glad you've made a way to take our gloom and lead us to gladness. Lord, I pray that maybe somebody here tonight that's down come the Lord's day, they'll find great joy. God, I pray you just do work and help your people. God, maybe some just need to come and thank you. Maybe some need to come tell you they love you. Maybe some need to come say, Lord, help me out from under this dark cloud. Maybe somebody just needs to go to somebody and say, I'm sure glad God's a blessing you. I don't know, but it'll just help folks be obedient. Because, Lord, it wasn't until they come together and they heeded unto what was preaching that they didn't get help. So just help folks to trust and obey, and they'll find they'll be happy in Jesus. Bless now in this invitation, in Jesus' name. Amen.